grace, mercy, and peace are yours, along with every spiritual blessing, from God our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, His Son, our Lord. Amen. Dearly loved disciples of Jesus committed to growing. My son, the budding military aviator, has told me that there is no such thing as a perfect aircraft carrier landing. Although I'm also given to understand any landing you can walk away from is a good one. <laughs> this mantra of military aviators has developed within that community a culture of almost but not quite. And there's good reason for this. This, this mantra keeps an, a usually arrogant cadre of aviators humble. They could use a little humility. But it's also designed not just to make them a bit humble, but to keep them alert. To keep them alert to all the things that can possibly go wrong, and at times do, when you're flying million dollar aircraft. Because you see, the military really hates to lose million, million dollar aircraft. And even more, they hate to lose the precious souls, the, the coveted skills, and the countless hours that they have invested in their pilots. Now in the same way, God himself, your heavenly Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of your souls, really hates to lose even one dear soul in whom he has invested his all, his life and his blood, and in whom then he has instilled his Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing your glorious future with him. Your God loves you and fiercely so. Now, although there was nothing you could do and nothing you can do to make God love you more, and although there is nothing you can do that will ever make God love you less, St. Paul tells us this morning that as God's children, we, we, certain, we are people who have there are people who have already been brought to faith by the Holy Spirit, we do, we can and we do cooperate with our God in His will or His purpose to preserve us in faith and in love and in the expression of our faith and love. As we strive to do that, St. Paul assures us that we will never attain perfection. We might be almost, but we will be still not quite yet. There is always room to grow, always room for improvement. So we are always growing, never satisfied. Now, I want to be very clear. It is 100% true that God has declared you to be perfectly, 100% righteous through faith in His Son, Jesus. But remember, that is God's promised, His declared righteousness that is yours through faith. And although God has promised that to you and declared it to be true of you, although God promises to see you that way, you and I, as sinner saints, do not yet experience that reality. As the name would imply, while we are saints, we are still sinners. So, like our military aviators, we will have a culture among us that is almost, but not quite. We will never live a perfect day. There will always be room for improvement, always places where we can grow in our relationship with Christ and with others. As such, then, we will never be satisfied with yesterday. Now, the verses we want to study this morning in uh, First 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4 follow on the heels of a report that Paul has received from Timothy in which he has shared with the Thessalonians in those previous verses. The report was, was this, that most notably their, their, their faith had been put into action. Timothy was just praising them for that. Um, and that they had offered prayers to God asking him to help them in, in persevering in a godly life so that they would be holy and blameless at the last day. Excellent prayer. But these words now follow on the heels of, of those words. Paul writes, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lusts like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to, live, to, call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. Now Paul acknowledged in those first two verses, in verses 1 and 2, that the Thessalonians were already pursuing a godly life. And Paul encouraged them to keep doing this more and more, because there's always room for improvement. However, he wanted them to keep growing, keep going and growing in their godliness and sanctified living. Now, what he says then in verses 3 through 7 are really almost the same what we heard from St. Peter last week. Namely this, abstaining from sinful lusts and desires. Why would Paul and then later Peter want us to avoid the sinful lusts and desires? Well, we learned last week because those sinful lusts and desires are enemies of our soul who seek to destroy us and our relationship with God. Anyone who rejects that instruction to avoid sinful lusts is not just rejecting a human being, but as Paul clearly says here in verse 8, they're rejecting God himself. And they're rejecting the Holy Spirit that has been given to them as a deposit guaranteeing their glorious future with Him. So what's Paul's point in these first eight verses? I think I would summarize it this way. Never, 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 ever stop fighting against those sinful desires, even though they will plague you until the day you die. And even though you may succumb to them at times, never, never, ever Stop fighting against them with daily uh, sorrow over sin, contrition we call it, and repentance. Keep fighting against those sinful lusts. Never be satisfied with the, with the small victories you won yesterday. Because there is no perfect day. Not yet. Now in the next verses, Paul pivoted from the thou shalts, nots, to the thou shalts, the don'ts, to the do's. We begin reading in verse 9. He said, Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And, in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Macedonia, that's a northern portion of Greece. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do this more and more. There again is that I'm having trouble this morning, clearly. 
There we go. Let's go that way. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. And now he explains what that is. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not de be dependent on anyone. Again, Paul doesn't really write anything to us in these words, with a few exceptions, than what St. John had told us a few weeks ago in, in his first letter. Paul encouraged the, the Thessalonian Christians to keep putting their Christian love into practice, their love for God and for one another, but also their love for those outside the family of faith. Now, they already had a reputation for doing this, but Paul didn't want them to slow down. He didn't want them to put their Christian life on an imaginary cruise control that doesn't exist in the Christian life. Rather, Paul wants them to do the opposite. He wants them to step on the accelerator and to excel, and he says to do this more and more, right, in their godly living, in the way they express their love and their faith both to God and to God others. However, as I mentioned, Paul does add a few additional thoughts to our understanding of, of, of these words and this concept. In verses 11 and 12, he expressed God's, word, or God's will for us. In verse 11, he wrote this, you should mind your own business and work with your hands. Peter would later say, don't be busybodies. Paul puts it a little bit more positively here. He said, mind, you know, your mind, your what? In your mind and with your hands, stick to the work that you have in front of you. The, the work that God has set in front of you, the works that he has prepared in advance for you to do. Now, what did he mean by this? What he meant is this, that any parent who is a stay-at-home parent should do what that honorable position requires of them, whatever it is, whether that's cooking, cleaning, whether that's caring for the children, feeding them, disciplining them, playing with them, or whatever might be required in their individual unique situations. He means that the factory worker, the professionals and others should work diligently at their jobs and should work and should show up on time and should work for as long as they have been paid to do that work. They should continue to build their knowledge and their skills and their craft. Those are the good works that God prepared in advance for you to do, the works that he has set in front of you to do. Now, one of the results of this, Paul says, is that what? Verse 12, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. Again, that's what St. Peter told us last week, isn't it? It's so when you are a diligent and faithful worker, when you are a person who minds your own business, when you are one who is developing your personal craft and your skills and increasing your knowledge to be better at what you do, well, that's a way to preach the gospel then with your actions and with your attitudes. And as St. Paul said, and we noted last week from St. Peter, outsiders, that's people outside the family of faith, are going to notice that. They're going to see that gospel proclamation in the way you, 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 you approach things in, in, your, in your work ethic, and they're going to have some questions. They're going to want to know why you do that. They're going to wonder why you don't slough off when everybody else does. They're going to wonder why you care about certain things when nobody else does. They're going to wonder why you show up when you do and you stay late like you do. They're going to want to know those things. They, they may even want to know other things. They might see your attitude and wonder how you can't be just as bitter and, and, and complaining like everybody else. And when they do, and they'll ask you about it, your preaching the gospel in attitudes and actions will open the door for you to preach the gospel with your words, as St. Francis told us last week. Huh? And that's what St. Paul's getting at. When you do that, you're going to win the recognition of people outside. So, moving on to the second thought then, St. Paul says this. He said that as you devote yourself to the good works that God has prepared for you to do, you will not be dependent on anybody. You will not need a welfare system. You will not need others 
to provide your necessities because you can do it yourself. Now that might just seem like a bit of strange advice tacked on to the end of this section, and so I think a little explanation might be helpful. It was reported that there were those in Thessalonica, Christians in Thessalonica, who had taken Paul seriously when he said, maybe we could say they misunderstood Paul when he said that Jesus was coming back soon. See, they took soon to mean in the next few days, weeks, or months. And so it was reported that a few of them had quit their day jobs to wait for Jesus. Paul had corrected that misunderstanding, and, and, and he wanted them to know that it was God's will for them that they keep their day jobs, right? That they keep doing the work that God had put in front of them to do right up until the moment Christ came, because nobody knows when that day will be. And then he later, a chapter after this, reminded them of something that bears repeating in our day. If anyone does not work, they should not eat. Now, before any of you seasoned, retired, or disabled citizens cries foul, there's a few things I want you to remember. Remember, first of all, St. Paul is writing to Christians who have the ability to work. He's assuming that they can work. Second of all, St. Paul, it, it's St. Paul's day, there weren't the modern conveniences and, and avenues that we have. So there wasn't a welfare system in their government. There was no th such thing as a pension. There was no such thing as a 401k, a 403b, or an IRA. Those didn't exist. So if you were going to survive, if you were going to have needs met, you had to work. And when you could no longer work, were physically unable, you had to rely on the help of your family. And if you didn't have family, you might be reduced to begging or relying on your other Christian brothers and sisters to help you out. That, that's all you had. Now, for those of you who have taken advantage of these modern conveniences like pensions and 401ks and 403bs and IRAs and who who have some measure of government assistance and social security and Medicare and you name it, right? Great. You've worked diligently, you've saved judiciously, and now in your retirement you can live on the money that you have saved. Excellent. But here's what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you can now go sit in your rocking chair and watch the Tweety Birds fly by. You may not have to go up and work a day job, but there are still works that God has prepared in advance for you to do. Works that he has set right at your feet. I don't know what that might be in any specific situation, but I could suggest a few. For example, you certainly can pray for people. You can become prayer warriors. Pray for people in this congregation, in other congregations, in our country, in other countries. If you're old school, have you ever thought about writing a letter to people or a card or maybe sending them an email at least to let them know that you're thinking about them and praying about them? You, you come to worship, as long as you're able to come to worship, you can be here and be an encouragement to people. You have opportunities with your children and grandchildren to continue to be witnesses to them. And I could go on and on about the opportunities that you have even though you may be retired. Because unless you are a quadriplegic, bedridden, or on hospice, there is something you can do. There is a good and godly work that God has put in front of you to do. And as a child of God, you will certainly do it. Why? Because God asked you to do that. Because He's declared you to be righteous in His Son. And you are going to strive to live or to be what he has declared you to be. So my encouragement for you, whatever stage of life you're in, if you are in the age of retirement, then do this. Get out that magnifying glass and start looking for the good works that God has certainly put in your pathway and work to accomplish them. But understand, we're never going to be satisfied with yesterday. Now it only follows that, that this would be true because our Father in heaven is never satisfied with almost but not quite. 
neither are military aviators. Yes, any crash you walk away from is a good one. We're thankful for that. But we don't want to be losing million dollar aircraft either. Well, in God's family, yes, if you survive the day, that's great. But what we're striving for is perfection. Perfection. God is relentlessly demanding of perfection. Now, thankfully, God in his amazing grace has provided perfection for us in his son, Jesus. Jesus came to live that perfection, to produce that perfection for you. And then Jesus offered his holy life on a cross to be the atoning sacrifice for your sins. In other words, the sacrifice that takes your sin away, that cancels its punishment, that, that cancels death for you. And God raised his son from the dead to assure you that through faith in Jesus you are righteous and your sins are fully and freely forgiven. So, that being so, we strive to be all that God has declared us to be. So friends, we never settle for good enough. We are never satisfied. God has declared us to be better than that. The time is short. The enemy is playing for keeps. Hell is really hot. And eternity is a very long time. So it is high time that you and I get serious about growing in every aspect of our life in Christ. That is one of the reasons Redeemer Congregation exists. We are here to reach the lost for Christ and to help those who have been found be more like Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we first of all offer you this simple prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you for coming to live in order to be our righteousness. Thank you for offering your life on the cross to wash away our sins. Thank you for declaring us both righteous and forgiven and for placing your Holy Spirit in our hearts as a deposit which guarantees our glorious future with you. As you have now declared us to be righteous and holy, we now pray, just, with those, just like with those, Thessalonians, with those Thessalonian Christians, that you would help us in godly living, so that we also may be holy and blameless at the last day. Help us, Lord Jesus, to reach the lost for you, and help us in our daily struggles to be more like you. We ask it in your name. Amen. Now the peace of God which goes beyond all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.